Lord, I can't help but think that over and over and over again in the Gospels, what you did was you looked at people and you said, follow me. Follow me. And Lord, when anybody comes up to us and says, follow me, we have some questions like, can I trust you? Where are we going? And Lord, life's realities and even your scripture backs it up for sure. Uh, You tell us that um, we can trust you, but you don't always tell us where we're going. You tell us it's going to be good, and you tell us you're going to get us home someday. But in the meantime, it's not easy following you. And you know that. Teach us, show us that you're so big and so strong and so uh, loving with a steadfast love to us that you just grab us by the heart and pull us through. (laughs) Amazing. So as we open up your word this morning, um, we come here meeting you, your God, we're not. And we've, there's so much that we need to learn about the dynamics of our relationship with you. So help us with that. Give us ears to hear. I pray your spirit would move in each individual life this morning as, um, as we encounter you today. In Jesus' name, amen. When it comes to people changing or something changing, um, when you haven't seen them for a while, it's easier to notice the change. Um, someone commented to me uh, at, before first service, oh, I, you got a suntan. You know, I was just been on vacation for two weeks. By the way, thank you. The staff thanks you for giving us vacations. The staff might even thank you for sending me away on a couple weeks of vacation, right? But, um, but, but they thank you. And they say, hey, you got a tan. And so I thought I'd just bring that up because I was hoping you would notice. No, no, I don't care about that kind of stuff. But, but the thing was, two weeks on vacation, it's not like the family sat around and goes, look, Dad, you're tanning. I mean, it's like, but you go away, two weeks, boom. Uh, you see a child that you haven't seen in a while, and you say, wow, how much you've... Yeah, all right, all right. Um, you see a friend you haven't seen in a few years, and you walk right by him, you go, whoa. You've lost a ton of weight, right? You've really changed. Or you come away from someone and go, wow, man, they've really aged. You know, you visit relatives, you you connect up with parents or something, and you go, wow, they're moving a little slower. Now, when you're away from people, um, it's easier to spot the change. The question this morning is, have you noticed the change? And what I'm talking about and direct us to is the changes that are going on in the world that you and I live in. Have you noticed the change? Now, our, our, our minds and hearts naturally are going to go toward you know, the bad things and, and because it's so in front of us. Um, but, you know, I'm a, <laughs> you know me, I'm a pretty positive guy, but I've not lost touch with reality. But when I think of, have you noticed the change, there are some things that I think of very positively. One is in my lifetime, I am really glad for the changes in health care because my wife went through cancer and frankly, she'd be dead today if it wasn't for the changes that have taken place in health care since I've been alive. I'm glad for the changes. Um, changes in technology and communication, it was amazing. I had my little cell phone and um, where I'm at on vacation, I, I sit in the cabin and um, there is no cell phone service. How cool is that? How do you get to a place like that? Sorry, can't get you. <laughs> you know? um, but what was crazy was I stuck the thing in my pocket, and I'm out in the woods on a four-wheeler with my father-in-law, and we are, in the bo- and we are out there in the woods, going down some trails. Then he says, hey, we just kind of found a trail down to the back of this lagoon, and we're down through all this thing. I land in this lagoon because we're checking out a beaver dam. Okay? And, uh, and I'm there, and I'm thinking, I wonder if my phone will work 
And guess what? I turn it on, I put maps on, and the little GPS pin went ping. I thought, whoa, this is like creepy. Who knows where I'm at even out here? But I love that phone. I mean, the communication, the things it allows me to do and us to do and the freedoms it gives and connect with people. So I'm really, really glad for these changes. But the changes that I feel are pressing in on my heart and probably on yours are, are other changes like this. In my lifetime, for example, take TV. Take TV. Um, now, if you're younger here, yes, I was born and they had TV. You know, I wasn't born before TV, all right? But I grew up watching uh, this show, I Dream of Jeannie, all right? How many, raise your hand if you, you watch this show. Yeah, a lot of hands, all right, it really is cool. Now, did you realize that I Dream of Jeannie, uh, they made her wear a flesh-colored navel plug? You go, what? Yeah, somebody goes, what? Look at the picture. Pull up some of the pictures. You go, she doesn't have a navel. Well, that was too revealing. That was too risque uh, for that time when I grew up watching TV. And so Barbara Eden spent the whole time with a flesh-colored uh, navel plug, all right? Uh, Ricky and Lucy, I uh, grew up watching them. They're married. Why are they sleeping in separate beds? <laughs> well, because, man, you couldn't show on TV two people in bed together. Ah, uh, things have changed a little bit on <laughs> TV, right? Everybody's in bed together and nobody's married, you know? Hardly anybody's married. So things have changed a little bit. Have you noticed a change on, on TV? Um, all in the Family, uh, when All in the Family showed up on TV, that was cutting edge. I mean, they exposed press into some really controversial issues. We laugh at that now because we have Modern Family. I mean, that's just like, uh, seriously? That's just like out there, push, are, are there any lines left? Cartoons. Yeah, I grew up watching cartoons Saturday morning. It was a time off. I was, there was four kids in our family. We'd get up, and you know, we had to get the rabbit ears going, and we'd get Dad out of bed. Dad! And you know, he'd go, oh, man, you know, I'm trying to get the TV in. And I watched Roadrunner. Me, me, you know. I, Roadrunner fans? Yeah, it's, I love it, you know. I, I could, never could figure out what acne was. I, I thought it was something you got on your face when you hit junior high. Um, <laughs> But uh, Roadrunner and Tom and Jerry, those are the cartoons that I grew up on in my lifetime. Well, then a couple genera- you know, generations or so goes by, and they grew up on this cartoon. <laughs> it's a little different, you know? South Park, Family Guy, these cartoons. Have you, you, you know, Tom and Jerry, Felix the Cat, Beavis and Butthead. Ah, you notice the change? Uh, commercials. I, I grew up, you know, frosty flake. There what? Great. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to do it. It's great. Well, on the left is, uh, you know, the commercial I grew up on, on CBS. Do you notice something different? Kellogg's sugar frosted flakes. Eh, that ain't happening anymore. On the right-hand side, we still got Tony hanging around, but these are frosted flakes of corn because sugar's like, no way, Jose, Right? So if you notice, notice the change. Now, when I talk about change in commercials, you know, <laughs> yeah, Viagra, seriously, did you ever just crack up out loud? Would you, you know, I, I, I still can't, I, it's going, seriously, like, I'll say, this is like on TV, a commercial, the kids and his family is, like, Viagra, really? And then, you know, how about GoDaddy? There's a reason I'm not showing their commercials, all right? I still can't figure out what GoDaddy is selling. You go, yeah, Dan, because you're so described. Yeah, right. what are they selling? I still don't know what the product is. Um, how about, you notice any changes? Uh, public education. Public education has gone through a little changes in my lifetime. Um, I, I want to read to you. These are, this is out of the New York City public education. New York City public schools, all right? A principal in New York City posted a list of rules for the teachers. Here's the list. Um, Men teachers may take one evening each week for courting. 
purposes or two evenings a week if they go to church regularly. After 10 hours in school, the teachers should spend the remaining time reading the Bible or other good books. Any teacher who smokes, uses liquor in any form, frequents pool halls, will give good reason to be suspect, suspect of his worth, intentions, integrity, and honesty. You say, when was that? That was New York City Public Schools. Principal posted that in 1872. No, that was not in my lifetime, all right? Not in my lifetime. Have you noticed the change? Now, I noticed the change in my lifetime. I was in high school. We, I lived in the suburbs of Detroit. You know, all this cutting-edge education. They were hip. They were cool. They were on the edge. You know, they were trying all these experimental things in education. They had the money. They were throwing money around like crazy, right? And, um, you know, interesting thing, a long way from New York City uh, schools, uh, I had a teacher who liked smoking pot and invited some of the students over to his house. And they just kind of all had fun together. And, you know, why isn't he teaching here anymore? Um, I had another teacher, I was in class, and she was a, a reading teacher. You would, it was this whole class to teach us to read better, read faster, read whatever, and, um, and books, and, and she... Um, she apparently wasn't reading her Bible at night, you know, uh, because she was hanging around with my classmate at night, and she was married, and he was 18, football team. He's quite the stud, and so she decided she's going to leave her husband and go take off with him. Um, things have changed a little bit in education. Abortion became legal in my lifetime, in my lifetime. We're trying to wrap our heads around that. Wow, really? This is, a kind of, this is like legal. And then the recent uh, revelations from Pan, Planned Parenthood, uh, if you've seen if you've not, you, you, you need to see them. The recent revelations from Planned Parenthood videos of how they are harvesting and selling baby body parts at Planned Parenthood. And you go, whoa. Have you noticed the change? Uh, when I entered the ministry as a pastor, you know, you know what the big issue was? One of the big issues, I was coming out of seminary and heading into ministry, one of the big issues was how much divorce was happening in the church. It's like, what's going on? What's going on? Followers, believers in Jesus Christ, covenant relationships and marriage are getting divorced. What's going on? What, and how are you going to, how is the church going to deal with this? How is the church going to handle this? This whole idea of divorce and remarriage. Now, I just got back from our national conference and the discussion around my peers and other pastors in our Grace Brethren Fellowship is hey, now, are you guys sure that you have all the documents and policies in place at your church so you'll be able to withstand the legal challenges that are coming down the pike because you won't do same-sex marriages? And I can't help but notice the change. <laughs> I can't help but notice the change. Now, you guys know me. I'm not a woe is me, let's all hunker down till Jesus comes type of guy. And there's a reason. There's a reason I'm not a woe is me, let's hunker down till Jesus comes. Because here's the reason Jesus told us the world would not be a nice place. Jesus was very open about that. They hated me, they're going to hate you. Okay. Jesus told us that. Jesus prayed in John 17, his high priestly prayer. Read it. This is his high priestly prayer in John 17, and this is what he prays for you and me as believers. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Father, Jesus prays, as you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. So, this is not a time. Have you noticed the changes? Yes. What's our response? It's not a time to hunker down, gather around, and look for Jesus to come. You know, I, I just, we're just going to play it safe till Jesus comes. No, 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 no. We're called to be in the world, protected from the evil one. We're sent into this changing world, right? 
But I don't know if you've noticed, it's like really changing (laughs) and raising a lot of unique challenges for God's people. So I want to do a series uh, this fall called Chosen People in a Changing World. This is where we're headed this fall. Chosen people in a changing world. Turn to 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. It'll be on the screen. Um, If you don't get there real quickly, that's fine. Make sure you don't miss it on the screen. This series kind of came out of this verse. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. It says, but you are a chosen people, or a chosen race. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now <laughs> mercy came a running. Mercy, you have received his mercy. Now understand that the world, uh, the world that the people lived in when Peter sent this letter to them was very hostile to Christians. It was very hostile to God's chosen people. What was happening in these times is Nero was ramping up his persecution. You say, well, what what kind of persecution did Nero do? Did he pass a couple laws? No, he took Christians and put them on a stake, covered them in tar, and lit them so he could put them out in his gardens for his parties at night. Oh. That's the world. The world that Peter writes this letter to was changing rapidly. Christians whose lifestyles had radically changed because of their faith in Christ regularly faced slander, they faced ridicule, they faced discrimination and physical abuse. That's the world in which 1 Peter shows up. One commentator on 1 Peter named Roger Raymer, he says this, the epistle could be understood as a handbook written for ambassadors in a hostile foreign land. It's a unique source of encouragement for all believers who live in conflict with their culture. Wow! So the first question I have to ask is, who are God's chosen people? We need to clarify that. Who's Peter referring to when he says, you are a chosen race, a chosen people? Who is he referring to here? Well, Peter's referring to believers like Many of you and I, believers, who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, and they follow Jesus. Their lives have been, they have new life in Christ, something's been birthed in them, and now God lives in them, they're his people, and he begins to transform them, and we live out a life of, of worship, and it's, it's radical, and that's, that's who Peter's referring to. In fact, he starts his letter out by saying to God's elect, chosen people, who have been born again. Wow. Elect, new birth into the family of God. Now, what's intriguing to me in this passage is this. What's very intriguing to me is how Peter describes believers. How Peter describes people who are in Christ. Did you notice? Look again at verse 9. This is how he describes, well, many of us who are in Christ. You are a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. A people for God's own possession. That means God says to you, she's mine. God says to to you, He's mine. That you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. Once you were not a people, now you are God's people. Well, you know what's intriguing to me about that description of Peter is that's exactly how God describes the nation of Israel. 
That's exactly how God describes the nation of Israel, his chosen people, and all of a sudden, you're flooded with all these Old Testament images and Old Testament pictures and Old Testament stories. So what is Peter saying? What is Peter saying? Now Peter doesn't, I don't believe Peter, Peter doesn't mean that God is done with Israel and now the church replaces Israel. No, Israel is still in God's grand plan of the ages. But what Peter is saying Listen, this is important. What Peter is saying is that the relationship that we have with God in Christ makes us God's chosen people. We have a very unique and intimate status with the living God, just like Israel did. Now this gets me thinking. If that's the case, as a result, what could you and I learn about God and about His relationship with His chosen people by studying the Old Testament? What could we learn in the practical, daily, kind of living this thing out? I mean, if we are called, and this is our calling, if we are a holy nation a people of his own possession, that we may proclaim his excellencies. Well, what can we learn about doing that by watching God, say, take his chosen people out of Egypt and then plant them in a most pagan, sinful, godless culture imaginable called Canaan, which he referred to as their promised land. Well, I hope we find out, because this whole fall, we're going to study through the book of Deuteronomy. So I want you to turn there. This is, that was all introduction to the the book of Deuteronomy. Don't worry, the sermon's not going until one o'clock, all right? I I want you to turn. This fall, we're going to study through the book of Deuteronomy. So turn in your Bibles, grab one out of the rack in front of you, and turn to Deuteronomy. Well, what page is it? Well, you got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Old, start at the beginning of the Bible and work your way in. It's the fifth book. All right, so everybody turn there. Deuteronomy chapter 1. See if you can get there in your paper Bible before everybody else does on their phone. All right? Deuteronomy chapter 1. Here's the verse 1. Here's what it says. These are the words of Moses that Moses spoke to all of Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness. Okay, so you've got to get the setting. If we're going to spend all this time in Deuteronomy, wow, what's it look like to be God's chosen people in a changing world? Then you've got, you, you got to understand the setting. All right? Moses goes to the Pharaoh of Egypt, and he says this, Thus saith the Lord, Let, what? My people go. Well, Pharaoh thinks he's God. And Moses says, no, there is one God, and you're not it. And that God says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, I don't think so. And Moses says, well, it's going to happen whether you like it or not. And it'll cost you quite a bit in the meantime. And so God leads them out, right? God leads them out of Egypt through the Red Sea and to Mount Sinai. That's the book of Exodus. It's also called Mount Horeb. And they camp there for a year. That's the book of Leviticus. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. They camp there for a year because what's going on there at the foot of Mount Sinai is God shows up, God gives them the law, God gives them uh, the Ten Commandments, and a covenant is established This is very important. The relationship between God and His chosen people is defined right there at the foot of Mount Sinai. God's going, look, before we head into the promised land, this relationship, you're my chosen people, I'm your God, so let's let's define this relationship before we head into the promised land. So that happens. Book of Leviticus. Book of Numbers shows around. And God says, all right, let's go. Let's head into the promised land. 
Well, they, they, they travel up there, it doesn't take that long, and they get right to the southern border, and the people start to freak out. They get a little scared. They go, ah, I don't know. And, you know, follow me. Yeah, God, that's nice, but I, I don't know. You know, you're big enough. So they send, let's send some spies in. So they spies in, the spies come back. Most of the spies go, we can't do it. You know, they're scared to death, and all the people freak out. They get scared. It gets contagious, and, and the people say, we're not going. Our God's not big enough. I know he promised to take us in there. I know, I know, I know. But he's got, and besides, what about the kids? That's what they said. All right, now that's a loose paraphrase, but I could show you verses. The the parents stood there, and they said, God, we're not going in, because if we go in, that's that's an ugly world in there. That's a pagan world in there, and there's big giants, and our kids, they'll eat our kids alive. That's exactly what the parents said. We can't go in there. God's not big enough. It, it'll eat our kids alive. They will be prey. That's the word. So you know what God said? God says, fine. Parents, all adults 20 years and older, we're going to wander around the wilderness for 40 years, and all of you are going to die off. A whole generation. You don't believe me? Okay. You're all going to die off over the next 40 years. And you know what God said to them? And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take your kids. Those kids that you said, this world's too awful. They'll never survive. God says, I'm going to take them in. I'm going to take your kids in. You didn't believe me? I'm going to take your kids in. So here's where we're at, folks. This is amazing. The book of Deuteronomy opens up. And guess who's standing there? right on the edge of going into the promised land. It's this whole next generation. The kids have grown up. The people that stood there in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 1, verse 1, some of them were carried by their mothers as babies through the Red Sea. They don't remember any of it. You remember the Red Sea? Nah, man, my mom had me running like a football. I don't, I don't know. You know. Some of them were like 10 years of age maybe when they're sitting there at Mount Sinai and all of a sudden, the mountain gets covered, and there's thunder and smoke, and people are like, whoa, God showed up. We can't go up there. Moses, you go talk to him. And as the kids, they remember this. Now, they're, they're growing up. Some of the kids that are standing there in Deuteronomy 1.1, where it says Moses addresses these people as they stand there about ready to go into the promised land, cross the Jordan River. It, some of them were, like, grew up on the road. You know, they're wandering around in the wilderness, right? So they're born on the road. They don't know anything different. I'm born in a tent. I live in a tent. We pack it up and move and set the tent up in the next place. And they just, that's all they know is life on the road is all they've known. These kids grew up and now they're adults. They never thought of asking their mother, what's for dinner? Because it was always what? Manna. <laughs> Every day, it's manna. And so now they're sitting there with their children. These were God's chosen people. Listen, a brand new generation, and they're about to enter this brand new world. They had no idea what they were getting into. God knew. The pagan worship, the depraved culture of Canaan was stunning. How Were these people going to survive? Well, the book of Deuteronomy is basically this. God addressing through Moses. Moses gives three addresses. The book of Deuteronomy is three messages, three addresses that Moses gives to the people. And you know what the central point of it all is? You know what the central point in the whole book of Deuteronomy is this. They are defining the relationship. God and his people are defining the relationship. God says, before we ever go in, we've got to define the relationship and renew this relationship. And God says, you have to understand what kind of relationship we have here. It's called a covenant. It's called a covenant. Now, relationships come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, right? We know this. We experience this. 
Uh, people say, well, what kind of relationship do you have with so-and-so? And so at that moment, we define the relationship. Well, we're just, we're just acquaintances. Do you know so-and-so? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, how well do you know them? Well, they're a good friend. Okay? You just defined the relationship. We do this all the time. Um, a couple will get together. Uh, boy meets girl, right? And it goes along, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden they go, it's time to uh, DTR, right? Define the relate DTR time, and they stop and go, ha ha, like what are we now? Are we just friends or are we a couple? We're a couple. Ha! Huh. Okay, so they define the relationship, went to the next stage. Then they go a while, and they go, hey man, this relationship's going on for a while. We, we need to stop. Where are we at with this thing? Well, I'm thinking about marriage. How about you? Whoa, you know, are we going to get engaged? And so they're defining. At these points, they're defining the relationship. And then they decide to get married. Whoa! What, what they agree to do there is enter into a whole new realm of relationship agreements and arrangements, right? I mean, you get married. Whoa! So they decide to get married. And then, so they sit down, they're going to come up with a guest list. And guess what? They have to do one of the most overwhelming things. Who are they going to invite to the wedding? Because now what you have is two people sitting there and they have to define the relationship with everyone they know. <laughs> Are we going to invite them to the wedding? Nah. Okay. Off the list. We can invite them? Yeah, we have to. On the list. We can invite them? Ah, I don't know. All right, let's put them on the maybe list. And what are they doing? The couple is sitting down with every relationship they have and they're defining. Well, yeah, they got to come. They're family. Well, yeah, they're going to come because of, well, no. and they're defining the relationship. Here's what's happening in the book of Deuteronomy. God sits there with His people and says, let's make sure we're clear about our relationship. And what God's going to press through so strongly is this. He's going to say, listen, you and I, we're in a covenant together. There is no relationship that you can enter into that compares to it. No relationship is that deep. No relationship is that serious. No relationship is that binding. Are you all in? This is what God is doing. He's saying, look, before we ever go in there, it's today we will define the relationship. You are my people and I am your God. Do you understand that, and are you all in? That's the book of Deuteronomy. I, I, I want you to watch this, okay? Three different addresses go on in Deuteronomy. Watch how this topic of the covenant and defining the relationship shows up all the way through the book. Watch this. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 8. We're going to fly through. Deuteronomy 1, verse 8. We're in the first chapter. It's the first address. Moses just gets going. Verse 8. See, I have set the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give to them and to their offspring after them. So God goes, look, I'm taking you into the land, and the reason I'm taking you in there is because I made a covenant with Abraham. And I swore, I promised some things to, to, to him. Abraham and I were in a covenant. I told Abraham I'd make a great nation out of him. Voila! That went on to Isaac and to Jacob. And then the, uh, Isaac's son Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. So they're all sitting there. And God says to the people, look, you're going in there because I promised this to you. Oh no, this goes all the way back to some promises that I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We are God, you are God's chosen people. You stand here in that place. Chapter 4. Chapter 4. Verse 20. This is all part of Moses' first address, his first speech. Chapter 4, verse 20. The Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace of Egypt, what? To be a people of his own inheritance as you are this day. Those are the exact words Peter uses. 
God says, I brought you out of Egypt to be a people of my own inheritance as you are this day. Are we clear about our relationship? God's saying. Look at verse 23. Jump down to verse 23. Take care lest you forget the covenant. You know, be careful that you forget who you are and what this relational agreement that we have with each other. Take care lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God which he made with you. And then you go, be be careful you don't forget that and go off and you make some carved image and uh, the form of anything that the Lord God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. He's like, you go chase other gods. Those are like other, other lovers. And God will in the Old Testament accuse them of adulterous. You guys are being adulterous because you're chasing other lovers, other gods. God says, I'm your God. And you're my people. And we're in this covenant relationship together. Verse 25. When you father children and children's children and have grown old in the land... If you act corruptly by making a carved image in the form of anything and by doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God so as to provoke him to anger, I'll call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will utterly perish from the land that you're going over to the Jordan to possess. You'll not live long in there. You'll be utterly destroyed. The Lord's going to scatter you among the peoples and you'll be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there you will serve gods of wood and stone and the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. You go, wow, that's really bad. But from there, you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search after him with all of your heart, with all of your soul. When you are in tribulation and all these things come upon you in the later days, you will return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. Watch this. He will not leave you or desert you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. Whoa. This whole relationship between God and his people was was at an incredibly significant level. This was like commitment. This was like bonding, binding. This was like, like nothing breaks this. And what's happening is this moment, as they stand here, is God's going, we've got to clarify that this is the kind of relationship that we have. Chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. This is a covenant. Now we're into the second address. Moses is going to come and he's going to give speech number two. All right? In in Deuteronomy chapter 5, and he's going to get into the Ten Commandments here. And Moses summoned all Israel and said, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the rules that I speak to your hearing today, and you shall learn them and be careful to do them. Watch. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. That's Mount Sinai. Not with our fathers did the Lord make this covenant. In other words, it wasn't just your mom and dad's thing, and, and, and it doesn't, it's not you. No, 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 no. No. He says, it, it's not with our fathers did the Lord make this covenant, but with us who are all of us here alive today. And you go, whoa, Deuteronomy is this incredibly defining moment between God and his people. Let's talk about. The relationship. We have a covenant here. See, God knew that before they went into the promised land, He knew what they were going to face. God knew there were going to be battles. God knew that there was going to be enemies. God knew that there's going to be the lure of all kinds of other gods and idols and ways to worship. He knew that. Because he knew what was going on in the land. And it was so pagan and twisted. He knew the level of sexual morality. He knew they would go into that land. And they'd look around and say, you know, our worship's kind of boring. Let's go over here. they got temple prostitutes. Whoa, are we going to get a good crop? I don't know. They worship this God and this God and this God. And look at, look at how they're prospering. Look at how their crops turn out. God knew they're going to get into all those things and they're going to be tempted. God knew the temptation of prosperity. God knew he was going to bless them with the promised land. And it flowed like milk and honey. And they would go, woo, this is great. And God also knew that, you know, in times of success, we forget about him. We wander off on our own and we think we do it. And God knew all that. And so what he does is he says, listen, 
It's to find the relationship time. Right now, here's the deal. You are my chosen people, and I am your God. It's time to renew the covenant. It happens at the very end. Go to Deuteronomy 29. Very end of the book, Deuteronomy 29. Now Moses is launched into his third message, or third address, wrapping up the second one, moving into the third one. Watch this, verse 1. These are the words of what? What's it say, church? These are the words of the covenant that the Lord commanded Moses to make with the people of Israel. Jump down to verse 10. Imagine standing there and hearing these words from Moses. You are standing today, all of you before the Lord your God, the heads of your tribes, your elders, your officials, all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and the sojourner who is in your camp, from the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water, so that you may enter into the sworn covenant of the Lord your God, which the Lord your God is making with you today, that He may establish you today as his people, and that he may be your God, as he promised you, and as he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. God's saying, listen, today, we've got to define the relationship. He says, you are my chosen people, and I am your God. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Are you all in? There is no re- A covenant relationship is deep and binding and as all in as you can be. And God calls them on that day and says, this is the deal. This is our relationship. Are you in? Now, what I can't help to do but go through that in Deuteronomy Now, I want you to listen again. Just just listen. Don't look it up. Just I'm going to read 1 Peter 2 again. See if it doesn't register a little deeper level. You. Who? Well, you who sit here this morning and me who are in Christ. You are God's chosen people. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. You say, what kind of nation do we live in? Well, you know, I don't know. That's a good, things have sure changed. But one thing that hasn't changed, all the believers in Jesus Christ are a holy nation. That's who we are. A people for his own possessions, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people and so I leave you with this question man I I, I read that and I I go back to Deuteronomy and whoa it leaves me this question so we have to ask say are you God's people today that's the question that I'm left with that's a question I I, I can't leave uh, these passages without asking myself Are you God's people today? Today. You know, over and over in Deuteronomy, it says today. God says this is a defining moment. Where are we at in this relationship? And so I ask you this morning the same thing. Now, you and I don't stand on the edge of the promised land. I get that. But here's one thing I also get. You and I are going to walk out of here in a matter of minutes into a very changing world that is becoming more and more hostile toward God's people are you going to survive so it's time to define the relationship are you god's people and i encourage every single one of you as individuals to think through this this morning you know, you and God, you know, how, how do you know God? People, I bet if I take a, a microphone around, uh, do you believe in God? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, define the relationship. Where are you at with God? 
define this relationship? Are you in, are you in what you could call, are you, are you one of God's chosen people? You say, well, I don't know about that. I, I'm, not sure. I'm not in Christ. I've been thinking about it. I've been toying with it. I'm kind of interested. Okay, but listen, listen. This is critical. Where are you at? And when I'm talking about you God's chosen people this morning, I'm not talking about being born a Jew, right? I'm talking about being born again in Christ. You know, Jesus, it was amazing. Jesus says, follow me. Over and over, he said to people, follow me. You know, I'll be your God. You be my people. You follow me. Follow me. But what was amazing to me is when Jesus ushered that invitation, he kind of paused. He would kind of go, now wait a second. Do you understand the kind of relationship you're getting into here? This is serious. This is like all in. Jesus would do this. In fact, here's a quote from him. You know, we're all like, oh yeah, Jesus is great. Let's all follow Jesus. Well, just a minute. Do you understand the kind of relationship he calls you into if you're going to be a follower of Jesus? Listen to Matthew chapter 10. These are Jesus' words. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoa. What's my mom and dad going to think if I just follow Jesus? Well, Jesus says, hey, it it doesn't matter. Do you love me? I read a great book over vacation about a guy who grew up in a Muslim home, and and over years, God just kept pursuing him, and he came to the place where he, he gave his life to Christ, and he realized that when he told his parents, it could utterly, literally kill his mother because she wouldn't be able to handle it. And he wrestled with this and came to the place. Whoever, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Jesus says, look at all your selfishness, all your pride, all the thing. You know, no, it all gets sacrificed. Your sin, you bring it. Your selfishness, your agenda, your life. No, this is, this is your following me. I'm the Lord. Next verse. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Because what happens is when people get confronted with this kind of radical, Jesus is calling us up into this like covenant level relationship. What happens is people go, wow, like, is there anything I can hang into, onto in my life? Well, I, I don't know if I want to give that up. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do, man, I'll just lo- I don't want to lose my life. Jesus says, fine. Whoever finds his life, you're going to lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. See, what Jesus is saying is, are you in with me? Are you in with me? Same kind of thing as the people standing there in Deuteronomy. Jesus confronted the people. Are you in with me, he's saying. And it's not about hanging out with Jesus. Hey, we like hanging out with you, Jesus. The food's nice, you know. Hey, let's do that miracle again. Wow, this is cool. Did you see that when he did? Woo, see my friend dance? He got healed? That's really cool. We like hanging with Jesus. Jesus goes, no, no, no. That's not the kind of relationship. We're not hanging out. We're not tagging along with Jesus. We're not going to church and sing about Jesus. It's not, I'm a Jesus fan. It's not, I'm going to get a little religion. It's not, you know what, Jesus is a great role model for all of us to follow, so let's try and be a little bit more like Jesus. Jesus goes, you don't know, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't get it. You don't, you don't understand. You don't understand. A relationship with Jesus is all or nothing. This is a covenant. And Jesus says, I'll be your God, and you be my people. Are you in? Jesus called people to repentance. It's a 180 degree turn from their sin and to die to self and surrender to Christ as Savior, Lord, and to love Him supremely. Love Him supremely over children, over spouse, over dating, over your career, over your health, over anything. Jesus said, this is what I'm calling you into. This is a covenant level relationship. So the question, are you God's people today? You say, wow, Dan. Yeah, no wonder most people walked away from Jesus. You ever wonder why more people didn't follow Jesus? Well, because he, he said, okay, you're going to follow me? Let's define what that relationship looks like. And people went, whoa, that's crazy. Okay.
But many people went, no, this is life. John 1. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. They became God's people. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. They were born from above. They were born of God. They were elect of God. They became God's chosen, holy nation, his people. Uh, Romans chapter 9 talks about this. As indeed in Hosea, Old Testament book says, those who are not my people, talking about us non-Jews, all of us who are non-Jews, those who are not my people, I will call my people. And in the very same place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. You say, where's that? It's all of us here this morning who in faith have embraced Jesus Christ as our Savior. Are you God's people today? Now, positionally, he chose us. I'm God's people, a holy nation, royal priesthood, belonging to God. Are you God's people? Have you surrendered in faith to him? If you say you are, and that's great, then the second question is, are you, are you living this out practically? Are you living as God's holy people? That's why when Peter writes, he says, look, this is who you are. Now live out of that. Live out of who you are. You're God's chosen child. 2 Corinthians 5.17 You're a new creation. You're in Christ. The old's passed away. Behold, the new has come. You have a new owner. God owns you. You're His chosen people. You know, marriage is always a fun thing to do. I love doing weddings. And, and you know, ask yourself, you ever stop and back up, and I, I get into this all the time in premarital counseling, What kind of relationship is this? They're defining the relationship. Somewhere along the line, they became friends, and they started dating, then they whatever, whatever. Now they're going, we're going to take this to another level. Guess what the Bible calls marriage? Define the relationship. You know what the Bible calls marriage? Covenant. Calls it a covenant. That's why you got this incredibly strong language when you do a wedding for example, I, I love this part of it. I, I, I get into this, you know. They make promises and they make vows. At one part in the ceremony, this is what I always say. I'll look at Leroy. I'll say, Leroy. And usually their eyes are big because, you know, they're nervous and everything else. I'll say, do you make, do you promise before God to love her and that forsaking all others... All those women you work with, Leroy, stay away from them, forsaking all others. That includes the women you work with and teach with and sell to. It includes your mother. It includes your sister. Forsaking all others. I've had to add that recently, that other part there. uh, To keep yourself for her alone. And do you make this sacred covenant today primarily with God but also with her. And Leroy's eyes are bugging out at this point. Yes, you know, I do. They say, I do. And then I look at her. Okay, Lola. Uh, Leroy and Lola. I tried to pick names I didn't think we'd find. Lola, here's the deal. He's all in. Now, Lola, and I go through the same thing with her, forsaking all others. All the guys on Facebook, no. They're not your friends anymore. No, forsaking all others. Your love is for him alone. Do you make, you guys are entering a covenant relationship. Do you understand that? And do you make this covenant primarily with God, but also with Leroy over here? And she goes, I do. Get this. Do you know what the scriptures call believers who are in Christ, you know what we're referred to as? The bride of Christ. Whoa! I'm the bride of Christ. You're a royal priesthood, a people belonging to God. This is a covenant level relationship it's stunning and oh yeah 
when we take communion, what is it that we say? When we lift the cup, what is it that Jesus said that we're, we repeat at communion in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five? 25? What is it? What is, what, what, what? Uh, okay, I, I get the cup represents his blood, but what's this other word in there? I don't know. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper and he said, this cup is the new, what church? Say it. Covenant. In my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So every time you take the covenant, God goes, the, the cup, God says, hey look, it's time to define the relationship Again, where are you at today? I got to ask you. I got to ask you, please. Are you God's people today? Let's pray. Please take that question out of here as you leave. I would encourage you to define it right now, right where you're at. You say, well, man, Dan, I've been here, I've been coming here, I'm thinking about all these things, and I guess today's my day. I get Jesus died for me, I, get, I do want to follow Christ, I guess today's my day. Well, where you sit, you say, God, I'm all in. I, by faith, take Jesus Christ as my Savior, cleanse me of sin, make me a new creation. I want to be your people. You, you're going to make me holy. All your righteousness gets applied to me. I, I get to be your inheritance. I'm yours today. If you're here this morning, you say, Dan, I made that decision uh, at some point in my life, and boy, this is a really, really healthy reminder. This is a good reminder. Where are you at? You're, you're God's people. Where are you at today? You wandered off. Maybe prosperity and success and everything is has pulled you away you forgot maybe you're chasing other lovers or maybe you're chasing other stuff and other things and maybe the trials and everything got you where you're going man i don't know man he's kind of i kind of you're just you're just distant right right now what today redefine listen you're god's people god's people be that right Recommit yourself to that again. Father, thank you for this moment when we can define our relationship with you, the most significant relationship that we could ever have. And thank you for what you call us up into. We're incapable of, 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 of having that kind of relationship unless you come and make us new creations and fill us with your Holy Spirit and enable us to carry out our end of the deal. And thank you that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Great to have you here this morning.